Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the University of Cambridge's MPhil in Bioscience Enterprise course. My name is Robin Hesketh, and I'm a member of the Biochemistry Department and also of the Cambridge Cancer Centre, a kind of consortium of everyone in Cambridge who works on cancer. For many years, I've given two linked lectures in this course on the molecular biology of cancer, with particular emphasis on chemotherapy the development of new drugs and strategies to treat cancers. And those lectures have been an annual highlight for me because it's been an enormous privilege and a lot of fun to meet the extraordinary group of people who each year make up this MPhil course. And it's a very sad business that we cannot meet this year. Nevertheless, through the wonders of IT, we can still proceed. And by way of welcome, my title slide shows a number of cancer cells labelled with fluorescent markers. Proteins are green and red is either DNA or mitochondria. But the main point is that it's very beautiful and it's also arresting in that it shows how incredibly dynamic cells are. They're changing all the time. And I'll come back to this right at the end of this first talk because it's important. This cellular fluidity gives us an early warning of the complexity of cancer biology. My second welcoming slide is a collection of flags atop flagpoles, and I hope that your country is amongst them to remind you of home. However, this being a talk on cancer biology, you will have guessed that there's more to this than a colourful greeting. The flagpoles represent the latest figures for cancer incidents, taken from the World Health Organization Globocan website. And to our group, I've added the highest and lowest countries. And I wanted to begin with a few slides about cancer statistics, because the numbers relating to cancer, the epidemiology, are so massive, so overwhelming, that they begin to tell us something about the underlying biology. Now, the obvious point here is that cancers are everywhere. No country, no race, no ethnic group is immune. And although men are slightly more afflicted than women, there's not a lot in it. This reflects the fact that cancers are genetic diseases. That is, they arise from damage to DNA. And human beings are almost genetically identical. That is, our DNA is more or less the same. But although for those reasons cancers are everywhere, there's a variation of about eightfold across the globe in the number of cases. And that tells you that where we live and how we live are major influences on cancer development. In the next slide, the game is to track the direction in which your country moves. These are the corresponding mortality figures, and a shift to the left is good, suggesting that screening and treatment have been relatively successful, and countries with a big left shift get a gold star. Moving right is not so good. With that welcome, let's just look at what the two talks are going to cover. I'll say a few more words about what figures can tell us and then give a brief definition of what we think cancers are. And that will lead to what's sometimes called the central dogma of molecular biology, namely that DNA makes an intermediate RNA ribonucleic acid from which proteins are assembled, and how it might be that changes in DNA, that is, mutations, can affect what proteins do. That will lead to summarising with examples the three main classes of molecules that can drive the development of cancers. And after that, we'll need a coffee break before we resume with a talk focused on the use of drugs to treat cancer, that is, chemotherapy. And I'll introduce that with a word about the Human Genome Project and the fabulous advances in DNA sequencing that have created new fields, genomics, the study of our genome, and derived subjects, study of proteins, proteomics, for example, that have underpinned much of recent cancer research. And then I'll talk about developments in therapy and where the future might lead us. And all of that, I hope, will have shown that both genetic and environmental factors are important, that there are hundreds of types of cancer, 
but they fall into three main classes, and how mutations in DNA modulate protein function to drive cancers. We'll note astonishing technical advances that are producing huge cancer databases with the aim of providing genetic signatures for all main cancer types and subclasses. And this leads to how the data permit the rational design of drugs, leading to specific examples, first of small molecule inhibitors, and then of the use of viruses and immunotherapy designed to boost the immune response to tumours. And finally, I'll comment on recent exciting results that may lead to more radical approaches. With those aims in mind then, we need to get on. But before I turn to looking at cellular aspects of cancer, just a few words more about epidemiology. The World Health Organization estimates that this year there will be about 10 million deaths globally from cancers, but that by 2030 that figure will have risen to around about 24 million deaths per year. Of the causes of cancer, tobacco is by far the most significant, and of course it's one over which, in principle, we have control. The World Health Organization estimates that tobacco usage in the 20th century killed about 100 million people. And in 2020, it's going to kill about 5 million people. In China, uh, about 600,000 are going to die. And in Africa, the figure at the moment is about 200,000 a year from the use of tobacco. And again, the World Health Organization estimates that by 2030, the global deaths from tobacco usage will be about 8 million, and 2 million of those will be in China. If we just consider the developed countries um, and ask the question, what proportion of deaths is, are attributable to cancers, the UK reflects this really quite well. And roughly speaking, about a third of all deaths are due to cancers collectively, and about another third arise from heart and circulatory problems. I'd like to show just one more example of environmental factors influencing cancer, that is, what we choose to do to ourselves. The red line shows the shift in bowel cancer incidence in the USA over the last 45 years. Since the 1970s, the high level, though it's not the highest, the USA is 45th out of 185 countries, has steadily declined, perhaps due to the publicity over the link with bowel cancer, whilst over that time poultry consumption has gradually increased. The corresponding figures for Japan followed those of the USA with a lag of about 20 years. It's thought because of the gradual shift to Western diets in the post-war period, whilst Korea has done likewise with a further lag of about 20 years relative to Japan. And if we look at a couple of countries where red meat consumption is very low, the incidence levels are indeed about 10 times lower, although the figure is rising in China. Again, it's thought due to a shift in eating habits to more westernised patterns. A major cause of bowel cancer is considered to be red meat consumption. More specifically, the effects of mutagenic compounds that arise from cooking meat. Although I should add that there is an alternative explanation that has been advanced by no less an authority than Harold Surhausen. He's the guy who discovered the human papillomavirus, which led to the vaccine that prevents cervical cancer arising from infection by the virus. And he has pointed out that a bovine oncovirus may be distributed in red meat and could cause the correlation with bowel cancer. But I have to say, I don't know of any evidence that supports that idea. So let's turn now to thinking about what cancers actually are in a cellular context. And broadly speaking, you can divide them into three categories. The vast majority of cancers are carcinomas. And these are malignant tumours of epithelial cells. So this includes malignant tumours of glandular epithelial cell tissue, and those are called adenocarcinomas. And it includes also carcinoma in situ, which is a pre-malignant change. That's to say where the cells proliferate abnormally 
condition called hyperplasia, within their normal location. And epithelial cells, of course, line all the major cavities of the body. They form the structure of the lung, including the alveoli, the air sacs where gas exchange occurs, and they form the ductal system in breast tissue. And indeed, they're in most organs, stomach, small intestine, kidney, pancreas, uh, bile ducts, salivary glands, and so on. The female reproductive organs are lined with ciliated epithelial cells and skins made of epithelial cells as well, which perhaps accounts for why it is that carcinomas are such a widespread form of cancers. The second group are, car are sarcomas, and these are tumours of tissue derived from the mesenchymal layer, so their connective tissue, bone, cartilage, muscle, fat, blood vessels that are often highly malignant when sarcomas arise. They're relatively rare, and in contrast to carcinomas, they're not thought to have a pre-malignant in situ phase. The remaining 3% or so of human cancers are leukemias and lymphomas, and these arise from the abnormal proliferation of white blood cells, or very rarely of red blood cell precursors. So the white cells, together with red cells, erythrocytes, make up the population of cells that continuously circulates in the bloodstream. And because leukemias and lymphomas arise in the blood and the tissues where blood cells develop, they're collectively named hematological neoplasms. And just bear in mind that leukocytes means all white blood cells, including lymphocytes. Some 20 years ago, Two luminaries in the field, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg, came up with a set of characteristics that they ascribed to a cancer cell. And perhaps the most surprising thing about this is that it had taken the whole history of cancer research to get to the point where anyone felt brave enough to actually make such a characterization. And about 10 years after that, they revised their f features by adding two more to reflect advances that had taken place in that interval. The first of the critical features that they defined was that cancer cells become autonomous in terms of growth signals that they receive from the extracellular environment. That is to say that cells normally respond to chemicals, hormones in the uh, environment that instruct them essentially as to how to behave, whether, for example, to divide or to remain quiescent. And in cancer cells, that requirement for instructions from the outside world to go ahead to divide um, becomes redundant. In addition to that, control of growth in cells is balanced by a set of inhibitory signals that essentially say the opposite to the cell, instruct them to remain quiescent, for example, if there's a shortage of nutrients. And cancer cells also become resistant to those inhibitory signals. As a result of this, they also fail to activate a program of cell death, very often called apoptosis, which is turned on when cells sustain damage to their genome, to their DNA, that turns out to be irreparable. And so cells lose what is essentially the first line of defence against cancer. And whilst all this is going on, they also develop abnormal metabolism. And this, of course, is something that had been known for many years since, in the 1920s, Otto Warburg, noticed that there was something peculiar about metabolism of cancer cells. And in particular, he noticed that they tend to use the glycolytic pathway to make their energy rather than using oxidative phosphorylation by mitochondria. And they do that even in the presence of plentiful oxygen. The defining characteristic of tumour cells is, of course, that they then acquire the capacity to replicate indefinitely, to make more of themselves in their own little world, independent of growth signals and inhibitory signals. 
But in addition to that, solid tumours can do something else. They can establish their own blood supply and they require that to provide themselves with nutrients and also with a way of disposing of waste materials. And that entire process is called angiogenesis, recruiting the blood vessel system of the host to make new vessels that penetrate the cancer. We'll look at that in a cartoon in a moment. As a result of all these changes, the environment around tumour cells changes. And what happens is that a whole host of cells flock in to the region of the tumour uh, initially intent on trying to destroy it as a foreign organism, but that then become subverted and support the tumour in its growth and its development of the capacity to spread. And that capacity to spread throughout the system of the host is, of course, called metastasis. And it's metastasis that is really a critical feature in cancer because the vast majority of cancers can be dealt with so long as they remain as primary tumours. But when they start spreading around the body, currently we have really rather few methods for dealing with that kind of development. So those are the characteristics of cancer cells as defined by Hanahan and Weinberg. And they hold good to this day. And we can look at those in a cartoon form by just making the point that cells normally respond to growth signals from their environment. The upshot of that is that cells are pushed into the cell cycle to proliferate and to make essentially two identical daughter cells. And the cell cycle, as I am sure most people will know, is a series of stages. There are two growth or gap phases, G1 and G2, in which the cell essentially doubles in size to enable it to split into two. And they are separated by S phase, in which DNA is replicated so that there are two complete genomes available for distribution between the two daughter cells. That cell cycle is regulated by a series of multiple controls that I'll talk about in detail in a moment. And an additional factor to progression around the cell cycle is the presence of genes that can make proteins that can repair damage to DNA, quite often at any rate. We've noted the importance of apoptosis, in which cells where DNA repair is not able to be completed uh, as a way of eliminating uh, budding tumour cells. And so the upshot of all of that is that whilst normally progression around the cell cycle produces two identical daughter cells, if something goes wrong in the way of DNA damage, what can result is a tumour cell, and that can expand from a single cell into a growth of tumours, usually referred to as the primary tumour. That may then acquire the capacity to spread around the body by a process of invasion, first of all, of adjacent blood vessels. And as far as that is concerned, we still think that that is due to a change in the expression of genes within these cells rather than to the acquisition of additional mutations, a point I'll come to in a moment. And both of these processes of primary growth and then secondary growth of um, metastatic tumours requires a supply of blood um, generated by the formation of new blood vessels. And the signals that normally regulate cell cycle progression come from genes that are often called proto-oncogenes. Uh, and the critical regulators of the cell cycle include members of the tumour suppressor gene family. And these two families, proto-oncogenes that can undergo mutation to become oncogenes, cancer-driving genes, and tumour suppressor genes that, that have developed 
to regulate normal cell cycle progression. So in a sense, tumour suppressor is a misnomer, but I think we're really rather stuck with it. It's essentially mutations in these two major categories of genes that determine uh, the acquisition of the capacity to become a precursor of cancer. And I should make the point here that these proto-oncogenes that can become oncogenes and the tumour suppressor genes are very often referred to as cancer genes. But this is really, although very useful, uh, it is pure jargon because these are not cancer genes that have arrived mysteriously from wherever. They are, in fact, normal regulators of cell growth that have become mutated so that they now behave abnormally and can drive the development of cancers. So having arrived at the point of mutations in DNA, let me just use a very simple schematic to illustrate what this means. And the notion is that uh, the majority of cancers arise because we accumulate mutations in our genome over time from the point at which we are born. And these mutations that arise after birth are called somatic mutations. And the general notion is that we need a handful of these mutations in critical genes, a handful meaning perhaps about half a dozen. And as this schematic illustrates, these accumulate over time to give us a group of genes that collectively have the capacity to drive the development of cancer. A small number of unfortunate individuals are born with a, a mutation already present in one of these critical genes. That's a germline mutation. And they then have a much higher probability of accumulating the appropriate cancer driving hand over time. And of course, what we can do, as we've already mentioned, is give things a helping hand by exposing ourselves to factors that uh, can promote the mutation of genes in DNA and the front runner in that of course is by using tobacco. It's emerged mainly from autopsies carried out on road traffic accident victims in Sweden that it's very likely that almost all adults are carrying around scattered across their tissues small micro growths that are abnormal and are in principle precursors of cancers. But for the most part, we know that these dormant tumours represent no threat to the individual, and we know that from the time scale over which cancers normally develop. Nevertheless, occasionally these dormant tumours can spring to life. And when that happens, they begin to release chemical factors into their local environment, the tumour microenvironment. And that's represented in this animation by molecular confetti emanating from the tumour cells and diffusing throughout the local environment. A critical event is when one of these chemical signals is able to interact with a receptor on an adjacent host blood vessel. And when that happens, it can stimulate growth in that blood vessel. And this is the process of new blood vessel growth, angiogenesis, quite often referred to as sprouting for obvious reasons. And the upshot of that is that the host vasculature penetrates into the tumour. And the key feature of this is that the tumour has now generated its own supply of oxygen so that it can now take off and expand as a genuine cancer. Occasionally, individual cells from within that growing tumour mass can acquire the capacity to migrate to an adjacent blood vessel, penetrate through the wall of that blood vessel and diffuse through the circulatory system around the body. Most of these tumour cells that get into the circulatory system don't survive. They're killed off by factors in the, in the circulation. But just once in a while, one of these cells can find a site on the inside of, a, of the blood vessel and then carry out the reverse process of penetrating through that vessel and then seeding a secondary site. 
and from that the tumour may grow again as a secondary and this of course represents the phenomenon of metastasis. These tumour cells have now become malignant and ultimately these events are driven by the acquisition of mutations in DNA and the changes in the activity of proteins that those generate. So this brings us to the central dogma of molecular biology that we mentioned earlier uh, and the notion that uh, mutations in DNA can affect the activity of proteins. Now only about 1% of human DNA actually codes for proteins. So for the vast majority of mutations that DNA acquires, they will have no direct effect on proteins. But those that do can have two very dramatic effects. So here we have a representation of a protein as a large number of amino acids. These are the colored blobs that fold up into a shape. And shape is all for proteins. And so in the limit, a mutation in DNA that changes one single base uh, can result in the change of a single amino acid in the protein, and that can produce a dramatic change in its activity. So I've shown that here as a fist changing to an open hand, representing the fact that this mutated protein can now interact with other proteins that it didn't recognise before it acquired the mutation. So its activity has changed and it's become hyperactive, if you like. And that's one class of proteins that can drive cancers. They're oncoproteins. Conversely, of course, a mutation that affects a protein may reduce its activity or indeed knock it out altogether. And either way, these two features can combine to accelerate proliferation. So if you have a hyperactive protein, it acts as an accelerator. If you lose protein activity, then you can lose a break on proliferation. And the upshot is that cells now are prompted to go into the cell division cycle uh, much more rapidly than usual and behave in an abnormal fashion. The first such abnormal protein, oncoprotein, encoded by an oncogene, was identified in 1970, and that's the protein known as SARC, and it acquired that name because it was discovered in the Rouse sarcoma virus, and many people will be familiar with the story. Peyton Rouse was a New York physician who kept chickens in his backyard, and when one of the birds developed a sarcoma, Rouse cut this out, mashed it up, passed it through the finest filter he could lay hands on, this was in the first decade of the 20th century, and injected the filtrate into normal chickens. And lo and behold, they too developed sarcomas. It took until the application of electron microscopy to biology in the 1960s for it to be shown that what Rouse had transferred was a virus. And of course, that was so small, it could pass through the muslin filters he'd used. That set the scene for identifying what this virus was carrying that could cause such dramatic effects on normal cells. And to cut a long story short, the answer turned out to be a permanently active kinase. Kinases are proteins with enzymatic activity and they transfer phosphate groups to specific sites on proteins. These targets are three amino acids, serine, threonine and tyrosine, and the real surprise with what was named the SARC kinase was that it phosphorylates tyrosine amino acids. It had been known for a long time that serine and threonine phosphorylation was important in metabolism. These ratios show the relative abundance of phosphorylated forms of these amino acids in cells. And phosphorylation is important because it can cause major changes in the activity of proteins. And if it sounds odd that a phosphate group can have dramatic effects, it's not about size. A phosphate group on a protein is like a flea on an elephant. It's because of the negative charge that it carries that affects the shape of the protein. The dominance of serine and threonine phosphorylation had led to the view that tyrosine wasn't very important. But if you think about it, if you want a signal to have a dramatic effect on a cell, 
what you need is a high signal to noise ratio and that's provided by phosphotyrosine. When cells are activated from quiescence to proliferation, the level of phosphotyrosine goes up by about an order of magnitude. So that was what the Rouse sarcoma virus was doing. It was carrying a modified version of a normal gene, SARC, present in the genomes of almost all organisms, and viral SARC had picked up a small mutation, a few extra amino acids at the end of the protein that has the extreme effect of switching the enzyme on permanently. It's now a constitutively active tyrosine kinase. I should mention that the Rouse sarcoma virus is an RNA virus, that is it has an RNA genome, a genome made of RNA rather than DNA, and it carries the enzymatic activity reverse transcriptase, which when the virus infects a target cell, transforms its genome into DNA, and that DNA is then incorporated into the genome of a host. So it's a retrovirus. And these cause tumours in animals, but they rarely do so in humans. But they can cause other diseases, of course, uh, notably the SARS coronavirus that was the cause of the severe acute respiratory syndrome epidemic some years ago, and the SARS COVID-19 virus that is the cause of the current pandemic. Now, the resolution of the activity of the a uh, SARC gene that had been acquired by the Rouse sarcoma virus led over the ensuing decade or two to the resolution of the main ways in which oncogenes can be activated. And essentially there are three of these categories. So the first is by small mutations and changes in DNA. The smallest being a point mutation, the change of a single base in DNA that can lead to the change of a single amino acid in a protein, as I've mentioned, or the deletion or the insertion of short sequences in DNA that can affect the coding sequence. And in the Rouse sarcoma virus, for example, the SARC gene had acquired an additional little bit of sequence uh, at its end so that the protein now has a modified C terminus and that modification effectively switches the tyrosine kinase activity on permanently. The smallest mutation that you can imagine as I've noted is a single change in a base and that's reflected in the corresponding RNA that is transcribed from the DNA and the upshot of that can be to produce a hyperactive protein produced in normal amounts because the control systems that regulate the expression of that gene uh, are not changed by the mutation. The second major way in which uh, genes can be activated as oncogenes is by duplication within the DNA. And this event can take place on a large scale, up to a thousand-fold duplications of the gene. And the upshot of that is that the protein is produced normally, but because it's produced from numerous copies of the gene, you get much higher levels of the protein, and that in itself can act as an oncogenic driver. And then finally, in these three categories, there's chromosomal rearrangements, and these basically fall into two categories. One where the gene itself is brought under the control of a different promoter. So it's now regulated by something that would normally not regulate it. And the upshot of that is that you can produce abnormal amounts of the protein um, uh, or perhaps produce them in cells that wouldn't normally produce that protein. Or the protein can undergo fusion with another coding region and the effect of that is essentially to produce a completely novel protein, a chimeric protein. I thought it might be helpful to show four prominent examples that you may encounter in the cancer literature. The Rouse family provides perhaps the best understood example of a single base change. Rouse mutations occur in about 20% of human cancers although KRAS is mutated in over 90% of pancreatic tumours. The single base mutation changes one amino acid in the protein to make it hyperactive as a constitutively activated molecular switch. 
Aneuploidy means the loss or gain of entire chromosomes. An example of loss is the tumour suppressor P10, which stands for phosphatase and tenzin homologue, and it encodes a phosphatase involved in the regulation of the cell cycle, and it's a target for many anti-cancer drugs. Chromosome translocation is a rearrangement of chromosomes that can produce novel proteins, an example being the translocation of a kinase, ABL, a close relative of SARC, to a gene called BCR, resulting in a novel chimeric protein in which the kinase is permanently turned on, and it's a frequent event in chronic myeloid leukaemia. And I mentioned that chromosome amplification can occur on a massive scale. In neuroblastoma, a rare cancer but the most common extracranial solid tumour that afflicts children, a close relative of the MYC gene, NMYC, can be amplified up to a thousandfold in advanced stages. A word about the second major category of cancer genes. These are, of course, the tumour suppressor genes. And the basic idea here is that both copies of the gene need to be lost before that effect is manifested and the effect appears as a loss of breaking capacity on the proliferation of cancer cells. Now the model for this was postulated many years ago by Alfred Knudsen on the basis of, of observing a childhood cancer condition called retinoblastoma that arises in about 1 in 20,000 children. It affects the precursors of retina cells that normally become cone cells in the eye. And in 60% of the cases, the condition is termed sporadic, when there is no family history of the disease and a single tumour occurs in one eye. And this schematic just represents the accumulation of mutations that knock out both alleles following fertilisation. But a second form of retinoblaster Retinoblastoma arises when individuals inherit a mutation in one of the alleles, one of the copies of retinoblastoma. And then, following birth, there's a very high probability that the second allele will be lost as well. That uh, model, put forward by Alfred Knudsen, became known as the two-hit hypothesis for the very obvious reason that both copies of the gene need to be inactivated for an effect to be manifested. It is therefore a recessive effect. And it applies indeed to the retinoblastoma protein and a considerable number of other so-called tumour suppressors, but not quite uh, to all of them. The cumulative effect of these oncogenes and tumour suppressor genes is of course to promote abnormal cell proliferation. And indeed, if you want a simple definition of cancer, cells behaving badly would do fine. That is, cells making more of themselves, proliferating, either more quickly than they should, or at the wrong time, or in the wrong place. And all of that brings us to the heart of cellular proliferation, the cell cycle. And we've already noted that conventionally the cell cycle is divided into four phases, two growth phases, S phase to which DNA synthesis is confined, and a mitotic phase in which one cell divides to produce two identical daughter cells. And there's also a phase called G0, which is one in, of, into which cells can lapse when they're not in the cell cycle and proliferating, a quiescent phase, in other words. You might suppose, and you'd be quite correct in doing so, that there are multiple layers of control of something as fundamental as the cell cycle. But the basic control is exerted by a family of kinases. These are the cycle-independent kinases, or CDKs, known also as CDCs, which is in the nomenclature in yeast. And these act sequentially around the cell cycle to drive progression and to maintain it in the correct sequence so that it can't go backwards. Critical to doing this are cognate cyclin proteins that associate with the cyclin-dependent kinases. And a number of them are shown on this slide. 
And the critical thing about the cyclins is that they're synthesized and then broken down at the phases of the cell cycle for which they're required. So there's a continuing synthesis breakdown, synthesis breakdown of cyclins that then associate and activate their specific uh, cyclin dependent kinases. Now you might suppose that because these cyclin dependent complexes drive cell proliferation, they would be the subject of mutations in cancers. And indeed, that turns out to be true. So there are mutations in a number of cancers that activate constitutively CDK4, for example. It's amplified in quite a significant proportion of breast cancers. And some of the other cyclins are overexpressed in a number of cancers. And then there's a critical step at the entry to mitosis that's mediated by a phosphatase, that's an enzyme that removes a critical phosphate group. In this case, it's removing a phosphate from a tyrosine residue, and that's permissive for entry into mitosis. And that uh, enzyme indeed is also overexpressed in a number of cancers. The prototypic tumour suppressor, retinoblastoma, plays a key role in the cell cycle. And this is important in cancer because quite apart from its role in retinoblastoma, the retinoblastoma gene is inactivated in about 30% of all human cancers. In the cell cycle, it works by associating with members of the E2F transcription factor family. And when it binds to these, it blocks their activity as transcription factors and prevents cells transiting from G1 to S phase of the cell cycle. So it acts as a break on cell cycle progression. This break is relieved by phosphorylation, releasing the activity of E2F to control key genes for progression through S phase. And that phosphorylation is carried out by the CDK4 cyclin complex that we met previously. And so the upshot of these interactions is that the cell cycle is driven by a succession of cyclin-dependent kinases, and these act as accelerators driving the cell around the cell cycle. If we take an overview of the cell cycle in terms of these key controls, successive kinases drive progression, the retinoblastoma protein controls the E2F transcription factors that are critical for traversing the G1 to S phase restriction point, and p53 regulates the same transition with respect to genome integrity. Unsurprisingly, given the critical importance of the cell cycle, there is one other layer of control, and this comes in the form of inhibitors of specific kinases. These comprise the INC4 family, and INC4s associate with CDK4 kinases to block their activity. So they are tumour suppressors, and they're important tumour suppressors because they are one of the most frequently inactivated genes in human cancers. Altogether, there are four members of the INC4 family, the others targeting different kinases. But the key thing is that they provide a sort of overlay of cell cycle progression control. By now, you'll guess there will be mutations in some of the targets that block the action of these suppressors, and indeed there are. And if we paint a broad picture, a variety of proteins drive progression through the cell cycle. A number of these are known to have oncogenic potential. They can become mutated to contribute to unrestrained cell division. And a number of tumour suppressors, perhaps better thought of as growth suppressors, act as negative regulators. And we one is a checkpoint kinase in the cell cycle, and it influences cell size by inhibiting CDK1. It causes G2 cell cycle arrest in response to DNA damage, and its name comes from the finding in fission yeast that if it's knocked out, the cells enter mitosis prematurely, with resultant replication of smaller sized yeast. So if we put that together in our original schema, the key thing to emerge is that there are a set of breaks manifested by the tumour suppressors P53 and RB1 that restrain cell cycle progression. The cyclin-dependent kinases do the reverse, 
and they therefore compensate it for the effect of the brakes. There is another layer of inhibitors in the form of the tumour suppressors INC4 and its close relatives. And these in turn are regulated by, for example, the uh, rate of protein breakdown to determine whether the overall balance is in favour of acceleration or of retardation of progression through the cell cycle. So having discussed oncogenes and tumour suppressor genes, a very brief word now about the third class of uh, cancer promoting entities and these are the micro RNAs. They're a relatively new class of cancer gene they are genes that encode short RNAs between 18 and 24 nucleotides long and these are unusual in that the RNA is not then translated into proteins. So these act as RNAs and they do so by interacting with messenger RNAs that do make proteins to control their activity. And so the bottom line is that microRNAs inhibit protein synthesis. They can, as a consequence of doing that, depending on their targets, function as either tumour suppressors or as oncogenes. And you can see that perhaps most easily by looking at two different expression patterns of a set of microRNAs. In this first example, that set of microRNAs have very low expression in normal tissues, but much higher expression in tumour tissues. And that's are consistent with those microRNAs functioning as oncogenes and to do that they need to inhibit the activity of tumour suppressing messenger RNAs. The second way they can function of course is as tumour suppressors and in that context the expression of the microRNAs is elevated in normal tissue and suppressed in tumours and so the deal here is that the microRNAs are normally inhibiting oncogenic messenger RNAs, messenger RNAs that would normally make an oncogenic protein. At that point, I think, is a good time for us to pause and perhaps have a cup of coffee. But before we do so, let me just make one last point. And this really harks back to my title slide where I show the very dynamic nature of cancer cells with an enormous amount of movement going on in them of proteins. And that's manifested, of course, by the expression of RNAs. And this just shows a set of columns of RNA expression from a whole range of cell lines. And each horizontal bar represents a single different RNA. And the bottom line is that they're all different. And what's more, they're changing all the time at really very high speed. And a, an extremely smart guy called Martin Steger, who works in the University of Halle, thinking about how to represent this extraordinary fluidity of gene expression within the cell, came up with the idea that you might be able to convert the levels of gene expression into musical notation and indeed came up with an algorithm for doing so. And more than that, uh, he looked to see if some of these algorithms, at least rather than just um, producing a discordant noise, could actually produce a, a sound that might be recognisable. And indeed, of course, they can. And uh, I'm going to show you, whilst you go for your cup of coffee, one example of that. Uh, you might wish to turn the volume down here. 